recording right now okay. and we'll edit, you know, we'll edit whatever we need to edit. Okay, fine. All right? Cool. So here we go. Ready? One second. Let me tell my assistant. One second. I will be recording for half hour. You want to grab a break. All right. We are now recording. So. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who know me know I'm Avi Hoffman, and I could not be more excited and proud to have my second celebrity guest for schmoozing with Avi, the brilliant Tova Felchu. Tova, I am so excited to be able to speak to you. You and I have known each other for quite a while. Indeed. Um, and although I have not really had the honor of actually working with you in a play or a movie, we did share the stage for a very short while in a piece called Mishigas, which Freddie Roman put together with you, me, and Jack Carter. And I will never forget that experience. It's one of the highlights of my career. Just getting to watch you on stage every single night was a, a master class. Um, but we are going to talk today about your new book. And boy, is that exciting. Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and it's a heartwarming and funny memoir from a beloved actress. It tells the story of a mother and daughter whose narrative reflects American cultural changes and the world's shifting expectations of women. And I can't wait to really get into you, to get into detail with you about it. But before we get there, I, 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 <laughs> I never changed my name because everybody said to me, Avi is way too Jewish, you have to change your name. And I refused. I am fascinated by the fact that you did change your name. <laughs> so could you tell our audience a little bit about that? You know, just, just a little bit. It was wild. I was called Terry Sue. My birth name is Terry Sue Felchew. It is on my social security card and uh, it is on my birth certificate. Those are the only two formal uh, uh, pieces of paper with that name. My and on my graduation from Sarah Lawrence College was the last official document is Terry Sue Felchew. I was always uh, named after my great aunt Tilly who died of tuberculosis in her late 30s. And I was named Tova after her and Sarah after my British great-grandmother who lived a long life. So Terry Sue. And as I grew up, there was Terry Culp, who was the boy in the class. There was Terry the Collie, which was my godfather, Kelly Volner's dog. And when I was educated, even I speak French, Spanish, and Italian, there was no word for Terry. Terry, Terry in French is a man's name. Uh, in Spanish, they call me Teresa because there was no Terry equivalent. And in Italy, uh, they call me uh, Tovina. But there was no, I finally was a Tova by the time I studied Italian, but there was no Terry equivalent. So it was a diminutive name in a time of the 50s when Jews wanted to assimilate. And okay. there were the Barbies and the, you know, uh, uh, the Debbie Reynolds. So the Debbies became Deborahs. And the Barbies became Barbers and the Terrys remained Terrys. And I fell in love when I was at Sarah Lawrence with a boy from Wesleyan who was a wonderful photographer and still is named Michael Fairchild. And one day we were head to head at my first job in Matunic, Rhode Island as a paid non-equity actress. I remember I got a raise. It says, Dear Terry, your salary is $30 a week, but you're doing so well. I'm going to give you $40 a week. Please tell no one. Tommy Brandt. Mm. So anyway, I was up there with Michael Fairchild. I, I was still in college, my first summer stock job. And he was the one who said, what kind of a name is Terry Sue for you? It's, um, you're, you live in the North, you're Jewish. What else were you called? And I said, well, I was called Tova in Sunday school. I didn't even say he, I have to put my phone on silent, wherever it may be. I didn't even brew school because I was slightly that whole Jewish thing about not being too Jewish. I was slightly concerned about saying Hebrew school. So I said I was called Tova in Sunday school. And he went, Tova, now that's a name. Right. And it became a love name between him and me. So it wasn't a political change. It wasn't a religious change, but it changed the entire landscape of my life. 
because we are judged by our perceived value. And, you know, Shakespeare says, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Everything's in a name because nobody's life is about yours. Right. Their life is about themselves and surviving and getting through the day and having a healthy body. So we use names as, as a shortcut, as shorthand. So all of a sudden I was perceived as a maven, as either an Orthodox Jew, an Israeli, a foreigner, none of which I was. I was, I was a cheerleader at, at uh, Quaker Ridge School. <laughs> and, uh, and as a result, some roles I had to fight for, but many roles came to me on a silver platter, uh, namely Yento, Helen right. Slomov and Holocaust, and then all, all the rest followed, uh, whether it's just a small piece like uh, Fierce Attachment for Vivian Gornick, or a bigger piece like being handed Kissing Jessica Stein, uh, being handed uh, Booby Cantrimus from A Walk on the Moon, most importantly, Golda Meir, and now Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm going to say Golda, Ruth. man. I remember you in Golda. Thank you. Oh, my God. It Thank was you. So amazing. Thank you. I had a lot of fat suit on me then. And uh, I was, at one point, I got to the weight I am now, which is quite lean because none of us go out to restaurants here in New York City. And I'm wearing pink nonetheless, even though we're in December, because it makes me feel good. And, You're uh, always beautiful. Uh, really uh, thank you. But I changed my name and it changed my life. Right. And, and you changed it to a Jewish name. I changed it to the to my Jewish name, my Hebrew. Right, to your Jewish name. You embraced your Jewish identity I and did, made I did an amazing think about it. And, and you know, it, 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 David Merrick took me out to lunch. I write about this in Lilyville, and he said, "You've got to change your name. You're out of your mind." That name's never going to get up on a marquee. And I said, "Oh, I bet you asked Barbara Streisand to change her nose." I remember. Uh, that. <laughs> so, I had I had the opposite. I was Avi Hoffman. Everybody said, no, that's too Jewish. You're too Jewish. You got to change your name. You got to change your name. And finally, I said, you know what? I think they're right. Maybe I will. And I decided I was going to change my name to Teddy Wayne. Goyish enough, Teddy Wayne. Because that's the character that I played in Law and Order. And I thought if I was Goyish enough to play Teddy Wayne in Law and Order, maybe I could be an actor named Teddy Wayne. But I couldn't do it. And I just kept being Avi. And then in 94, I ended up writing my Two Jewish show. Yeah, it's very successful. And that changed my life. And it really embraced my Jewish identity for the first time. Um, let me, let me, uh, you, look, if I had to start reading all of your credits, the half hour would not be enough because we'd be going on and on and on. Needless to say, you have done film and television. You've done so many different kinds of roles, so many varied characters. Um, but you know me, I love theater. So to me, the fact that you did things like Cyrano and Yentl and Lend Me a Tenor and Golda, man, you're Golda. Would you share with, with us for a moment, for just a couple of minutes, your most outstanding experiences in either film, television, or theater that, that you, characters that you've played, you know, just... Well, I can, I, can, I can talk to you about a journey. I, I also write about this in Lilyville, which you can get at tovafelcher.com slash Lilyville. It's on pre-sale now at, ta at Target, at Barnes & Noble, on Amazon, and at the independent bookstores. My publisher likes to support the local bookstores in your community, so you can just uh, hit a button on my website, and it would take you there. Anyway, uh, when I was at the Guthrie, uh, Michael Lang was the artistic director, and basically it was transmitted to me through a series of his actions and the actions of another director, John Hirsch, that I did not have any talent as an actor. I mean, none. So they got rid of me because they loved my brother. My brother was assistant artistic director by the time he was 26. So they got rid of me because I could sing and dance, and singing and dancing in a classical rep company which praised and and prided themselves in iambic pentameter. Singing and dancing was like being a, being a circus performer, which I got to do in Pep, Pippin many years later. I was very happy. But I could sing and dance, so they let me go into Cyrano, and one of our leading ladies dropped out as the food seller. So I went to Broadway. I came to New York on Broadway at the Palace Theater in 1973 with Christopher Plummer in Cyrano with 14 lines and a red dress as the food seller. But my 14 lines... Six of them were spent alone with uh, Cyrano on the stage where he would kiss my hand 
and one of the lines was was spent opening the show. So my debut on Broadway, I had the first line, oranges, pomegranates, lemonade, and I came out alone with my fruit basket and the stuff I was selling in a beautiful red velvet dress that Desmond Healy made for me. But I was told at the Guthrie to pretty much hang it up, that I might as well become an accountant. John Hurst said to me, uh, I was playing Peas Blossom for him in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and in front of the entire company, I went, I, it was a very difficult role to play one of the, the first fairy, and I remember the speech was, over hill, over dale, through a bush, through a briar, over park, over pale, through a flood, through a fire, and he went, stop! <laughs> so you want to be an actress? And I, I, said to, I said to him, yes, I'd like to be an actress. Meanwhile, I'm thinking to myself, no, I'm just sitting here half naked playing a fairy for no reason at all. Anyway, he says, you want to be an actress and I suggest you act. Otherwise, become an accountant. So he said that in front of everybody. Langham would never give me a big role. I was really a spear carrier. And what was great about the whole experience is that I had to get out of there. So I go and I do Cyrano with the 14 lines in a red dress, and agents immediately pick me up, and all I want to do is star in repertory as a leading lady to prove to them and myself that I actually could act. So I got the leads at the Cleveland Playhouse, the Ingenue leads, and the leads at Stage, uh, Stage West in Springfield, and I so wanted to go to Cleveland. It was a longer season. I was going to do O'Neill's Touch of the Poet, and Stage West was lovely. It was Irina in the Cherry Orchard, and then uh, a little-known composer named Barry Manilow had written a 19th century spoof called The Drunkard, and I was going to play Mary Middleton, the lead. And my agent said to me, you're not going to Cleveland. It's too far away. You're going to Springfield. And every Monday, you're going to come in and audition. And I auditioned for David Merrick, and he offered me this, the understudy and then the standby to Bernadette Peters and Mac and Mabel, and I turned it down. What? I said, Mr. Merrick... Mr. Merrick, I have understudied for two years at the Guthrie and I never went on. It is a high stress job with very little return, not enough rehearsal and you're called at the last minute. And I cannot stand to be face to face with my own mediocrity. So mm -hmm. my, my chances of being excellent for you are extremely curtailed and I'm turning down your kind offer. However, if you have a part for me in any play or musical with, you know, with an audition or whatever, where I am the part, the answer is yes. And a few months later, he said, you're, you're out of your mind. Bernadette won't, won't be able to do every show. You could be even a, a, a standby where you call from your apartment. And my identity was so wound up in proving to myself that I had capabilities. I came from a family like many Jewish children where if it wasn't an A, it was an F. I mean, we weren't told to get good grades. We were I got four A's and a B plus. That was I. I my math was always B plus. I was never a great math student, but as a result, I have a great memory now for numbers. I guess I, that brain, that part of my brain, is less used than the other stuff. So, to make a long story short, a play came up called Dreyfus in Rehearsal, directed by Garson Kanan with Ruth Gordon as a lead. And Garson went to Merrick, and Merrick said, "You know, I've got this actress. I believe in her. She's good. Her name is Tova Felchu. She could play Miriam Polodnik in your play." And Garson came and said, "Tova Felchu, Miriam Polodnik, with a name like that, she's <laughs> got to be right." And he handed me the part without uh, without audition, and thus the Tova Felchu ness wow. began to take off. And then a few months after that, I I, I was on the marquee at the O'Neill Theater. And Ruth Gordon was your maiden of yeah. honor at your wedding, yes. Uh, Ruth, Ruth was my matron of honor, and Garson was our witness. He signed the ketubah. And um, and all of this is in your book? All of this Tell is in my book. Tell me about the if, book. If, if, I am if, amazed by books, because recently our organization has actually started to publish books. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, we've suddenly gotten into the publishing business. I don't understand anything about it, but we're selling six different books. Um most of my mom's, you know, you know my mother. So That's she's written wonderful. four different books and we have put them out to the world and it's really great. And now other people are coming to us as well. How did you decide, when did you decide and how did it come together for you to write this book and tell us about it? And, you know. Thank you so, so much, so much. Yeah. So just to, just to recap the first question, the journey of proving that I could be a great classical actress was a theme. I am, you know, I even say this 
welcome to Lilyville, where my mother Lily reigns. Lily, who gave birth to this adre adrenaline junkie perfectionist daughter. Lilyville, where when I wanted to go to Juilliard, my mother said, you're not going to a trade school. So it's just <laughs> wild stuff. I, uh, I was on a holy grail to prove that I could act. So much so that when I did Yentl and got these ridiculous reviews and Alan Shane flew in from the coast to offer me Three's Company to come out, I turned him down. And he said, are you crazy? You're crazy. I said, I'm telling you, I don't know how to act yet. This Yentl is a lucky coincidence. It's energetic and it's a boy girl. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tomboy. I'm a boy girl. I used to hang upside down on Dr. Clark's apple trees and my brothers hand me down brown shorts. <laughs> I remember it. I, was, I wasn't a Vilda Chaya, but I was, you know, I was jumping off of, uh, of my swing set and, uh, and r riding ponies and eventually got a horse. And went on. But anyway, I turned to him and I said, I don't know how to act yet. And instead, I went to Jack O'Brien and starred as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet for him as Isabella in Measure for Measure, as Marjorie Pinchwife in The Country Wife. And by the time Deanna Maddox, my great uh, Shakespearean coach, got, got finished with me, I knew what I was doing. Right. And I could hold my head up high, and that technique has never left me. Now, Albert Lee, an agent at UTA, is riding the subway, and he listens to an interview I did for NPR. He gets to the office, he calls my manager, and he says to the managers in Hollywood, do you represent, does Tova Felcher have a literary agent? And they said, no. He said, I've been listening to this interview. I think she's got a writer's voice. May I meet with her? And I, of course, said yes. And I met with this brilliant Princeton graduate. And he said, what do you want to write about? I said, well, I'd like to write about my 103-year-old mother, Lily. I want to do a series, a TV series called Lilyville. And I don't know how to write a pilot yet, but I'm going to learn. So we said, well, why don't we make this a book first? I want to agent for you and he got me an incredible deal with Hachette and um, that book advance has sustained me in this time of COVID. It was my main job. I was a paid writer for yeah. Hachette International and they're publishing the book. So I, what's interesting about the book, it's that a me it's a memoir to the eyes of my mother and me. It's not just, and her view of what it means to have a career in the entertainment field. And she was born on a dining room table in 1534 Charlotte Street in the Bronx in 1911. And this book is being published in 2021. So it will cover 110 years of American history, of Jewish immigrant history. Of course, I, like many of my colleagues, my, all my grandparents were European, from Austria, uh, my grandfather David Felchu, from Germany, Marion Ackerman Felchu, who came to the United States through Canada and was brought up uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. My grandmother, Ada, who was British, and my grandfather, Gershon, who was Russian. So when I do Grandma Ada in my one woman show, I use my grandfather's accent, but the story is really the story of my grandma Ada, who went to the British musical. But you couldn't do a British Jew 25 years ago and have people compute that this was, that this was the right choice at that time. So I, I took Grandpa's accent and did Grandma's story. She she went to the British Music Hall to sing and to dance. She wanted to be an actress. And they said, Ada, show us your ankles. And she uh -huh. showed them my ankles. And then they said, Ada, show us your knees. And she said, that was the end of my theatrical career. Nobody <laughs> saw my knees except Grandpa. And then, not so often. So she's... Uh -huh. <laughs> so anyway, I was asked to write a book. And I wanted to write this book dedicated to my mother, Lily, who now that she has left me, is always with me and I wanted to make sure that my daughter and my son and my grandchildren knew that Lily was in them, in their heads, in their bones, in their hearts, just as your forebears, Avi, are, are within you, within your blood, within your genetics, within Ooh. your epigenetics, within your memory. And that's the universal of the book because it's the t story of a parent child and their journey toward each other, trying to making us happen, which didn't happen for many years. And what I love about what you're telling me is indeed the Jewish contribution to the mainstream American culture and history sounds to me like a lot of what your book is about. That hundred year span of how the Jewish immigrants created American mainstream culture in so many ways. Whether 
You know, absolutely. And not only that, but the Jewish values. So therefore, to be an actress was close to being a vagabond. I didn't come from a, I came from a family where my grandmother dreamed of being an actress and she gave it up to be a wife and a mother of four girls. And Gershon, my grandfather, who was a master, not a tailor, not a, not a Schneider, he was the man who cut the patterns. He cut, and whenever he was in business mm. for somebody else, they had a Benz, and they were rich. And whenever he, he went into his own label, and I have the label, it says G. Kaplan, Fifth Avenue, he oh. would lose his money because he, he wasn't as entrepreneurial and as clever with business as you are, Avi. And um, it, it, uh, her values... She made a shrine and a throne to Andrew Harris Levy. When I married that Harvard lawyer, she could right. find you. <laughs> so I had already run five awards on Broadway. I was already starring in Yentl. Yentl was finished. I was about to do Holocaust, which would get me uh, my second Emmy nomination. And on my wedding day, my mother said, Salva, darling, you can do whatever you want now. And I figured she was going to say, you can try movies. You can go to Hollywood. She said, you're marrying a Harvard lawyer. And right. that's where the value was. And it wasn't that she was creepy. She was a preserve and protect person. Right. Like I am for my children. But times have changed. Times and, have changed. And we all know that theater is precarious at best. You know, the, the arts are precarious at best. And indeed, we've learned with COVID how fragile our industry really is. Um, so... I'm so excited about the book. I can't wait to read it. I'm so excited that you're excited. Please tell everybody who loves you. It's a lot of people. Of course. www.tovafelchu.com slash Lilyville. So through the website, I don't get anything for it, but Amazon does. You can buy the book. It's $28, the hardcover. And yeah, if you buy it, if you buy it in pre-sale now, and you send me via info at concertsbytova.com, this is all on the website, you send me your address, and a picture of the sales slip, I will write a custom made book plate to you. Wow. To Avi, right, a pillar of international Yiddishkeit with <laughs> all my love, Tova, parenthesis, felt you. I will write a personalized book plate to you, of course, at no charge, and I'm gonna send it to you. You know that I can't wait for that. Let me now ask you I'm assuming that your son Garson is named after your grandfather, Gelshin. Mm -hmm. And I read that in 2015, you decided to take your son and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I did. I did. And I met with my beloved friend, a brilliant, a brilliant writer as well, Janice Kaplan, who when I was first meeting with Albert Lee and, and his associate, Lane Zachary, who is still my wonderful agent, um, Janice Kaplan said, why don't you write about climbing Killy with Brandon? I said, because maybe that would be my next 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 best uh, project or really my next best project this is lilyville my next project would be sydneyville but it'd be a little more difficult to play my father though having played yentl and other trouser roles maybe not but right. uh, brandon and i climbed killy and i was the oldest climber by 15 years in our six-man group we had six climbers one of whom was deborah messing's brother of all things wow. and brooke baldwin the great anchor at cnn so we had six climbers, we had 40 Sherpers. It's not because we were spoiled brats. It's because we had to carry our knapsacks at 25 pounds, but they carried the stove, the tents, right. the outhouse, you know, the, the toilet. It was wild. It was a life-changing experience I hope never to experience again. I was going to say, Jews that I know don't climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I, I, can't, I can't even fix the cabinet when it breaks down. It's like, oh, yeah, i got to call somebody. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, an, I'm an athlete for my father. He was an Austrian. He was an American, but he was, you know, he said, Tova, if you pee and you poop and you cut a sweat every day, where can disease land? He was right. very, very... Optimistic. I also write about the ups and downs of marriage in the book because I married for almost 44 years. My wow. parents were married 63 years. My parents in law were married 63 years. And there hasn't been a divorce in my direct line for over 200 years. We wow. there's a there's a chapter called Marry Like a Jew, Divorce Like a Catholic. That's right. it. Oh, I believe in marriage. I've done it four times. So, uh, <laughs> so finally, my question is now, you know, you have accomplished unbelievable success in all of your fields. And now you're even a writer with your own book, which I predict will be a bestseller. 
I now, hope so. I hope now so. what? Tov, tovale. Now, now what? what? Yeah. I'm expecting a one-woman play about RBG. I would like to take a play called Sisters-in-Law about RBG and her relationship to Sandra Day O'Connor to Broadway if we ever get out of this mess. But in the meantime, besides putting RBG in my act because I played her in the premiere of Sisters-in-Law in Los Angeles, I met her four times before she died within wow. the last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had two private interviews with her, and uh, we talked a lot about opera and stuff. And then I saw her in two public venues where I was invited, a, a, a dinner in Philadelphia and a din dinner at Union Theological Seminary. Wow. So it... Um, that Sounds would be what I've got my, my eyes on. And I would love to get back on the stage or star in a series. Because, like, series, in a way, is a Zoom experience. You know, your, your work becomes ubiquitous. You can distribute it. And it's true. You said there was a small... There's always an upside to every gosh darn um, challenge. And this the COVID thing is a big one. And this ability, like I'm having Shabbat tonight, and I write 90 of my relatives from Australia to Caesarea wow. so we can gather for Shabbat. Now, you, you could never do that in person. That's a reality TV show right there, the Felcher Family Zoom. That's true. We're on our 35th. We're on our 35th. I there should record go. them all. I should there record them go. all. And Tell this, Ellen. yes. I am so, so happy. Our time has come to an end, but please yes. tell everybody one more time, show them the book, tell them where to buy it. And uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful. It's called Lilyville. And this picture is from my bat mitzvah, December oh. the 8th in an undisclosed decade and uh, in Scarsdale, New York. And it's Lilyville, mother, daughter, and other roles I've played. There's my mommy, Lily. And there I am at the reception when I was at the Bema, of course, I wore a bolero jacket so that my shoulders didn't show. Yeah.